بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم جاما is a positive real number eta is a real number in the open interval from 0 to 1 we are interested in the sum over positive integer n of n times the integral x from 2n minus 1 times pi to 2n plus 1 times pi of sine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared note that inside the integral x is between 2n minus 1 pi to 2n plus 1 pi x over 2 pi is between n minus half and n plus half x over 2 pi plus 1 half is greater than n and is less than n plus 1. We can move this n inside the integral and rewrite n as the floor of x over 2 pi plus 1 over 2. We try now to find a representation of this floor function that allows us to obtain the sum of interest. Summation n from 1 to infinity sine alpha m z to the n. z is between minus 1 and 1. Alpha is a non-zero real number. This sign is the imaginary part of e to the i alpha n. This summation is the imaginary part of the sum over positive integer n of z e to the minus alpha all to the power n. The magnitude of z is strictly less than 1. This is a convergent geometric series that is equal to the first term z e to the i alpha divided by 1 minus the ratio of the geometric series. Multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 minus z e to the minus i alpha. Downstairs, we get 1 plus z squared minus z times 2 cosine alpha. In the numerator, we have z e to the i alpha minus z squared. z is a real number between minus 1 and 1. When we take the imaginary part, we obtain z sine alpha in the numerator. Now take this summation and this quantity, divide by z, and integrate from 0 to x. If we integrate the left-hand side term by term, we get summation over positive integer n of sine alpha n x to the n divided by n. Here, after dividing by z, this z goes away, and we have the integral z from 0 to x of 1 over z minus cosine alpha all squared plus sine alpha squared. The antiderivative of this function is 1 over sine alpha. The inverse tangent of z minus cosine alpha divided by sine alpha. Sine alpha goes away with that sine alpha. We end up with this inverse tangent function. When we use the limits of integration, we get this sum equal to the inverse tangent of x minus cosine alpha over sine alpha minus the inverse tangent of minus cotan alpha. Minus cotan alpha is tan alpha minus pi over 2. If x is set to 1 here, we have 1 minus cosine alpha over sine alpha. The numerator is 2 sine alpha over 2 squared. The denominator is 2 sine alpha cosine alpha. 1 minus cosine alpha over sine alpha is tan alpha over 2. This summation is the inverse tangent of tan alpha over 2 minus the inverse tangent of tan alpha minus pi over 2. The principal arc tan value is in the open interval between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. If eta is in this range, the inverse tangent of tan eta is equal to eta. If eta is outside this range, we bring it into this range via plus or minus a multiple of pi. For instance, if eta is between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, we need to subtract pi. If it is in the open interval from 3 pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2, we need to subtract 2 pi. If it is between minus 3 pi over 2 to minus pi over 2, we need to add pi, and so on. So tan inverse tan eta is eta minus pi, then the floor of eta over pi plus one half. We can use this relation here to express these two functions and to obtain that the sum over positive integer n of sine alpha n over n, where alpha is a non-zero real number, is pi over 2 minus alpha over 2 plus pi, the floor of alpha over pi, minus pi, the floor of alpha over 2 pi plus one half. The well-known result regarding the floor function is that the floor of beta plus the floor of beta plus one half is equal to the floor of two beta. The real number beta can be written as the sum of the floor plus the fractional part. The fractional part is greater than or equal to zero and is strictly less than one. If the fractional part is greater than or equal to zero and is strictly less than one half, then the floor of beta plus one half is equal to the floor of the floor of beta plus the fractional part of beta plus one half. This is equal to the floor of beta, which is an integer, plus the floor of the fractional part of beta plus one half. Since it is assumed that the fractional part is strictly less than one half, then this quantity is strictly less than one, and this floor is equal to zero. The floor of beta plus one half is equal to the floor of beta. The floor of beta plus the floor of beta plus one half is equal to two times the floor of beta.
what about the floor of two beta? The floor of two beta is the floor of two times the floor of beta plus two times the fractional part of beta. This is an integer, so this floor is two times the floor of beta plus the floor of two times the fractional part of beta. This is a number between zero and one. It is strictly less than one, so this floor is equal to zero. We also get two times the floor of beta, like in this case. The other possibility is that the fractional part of beta is greater than or equal to one half and is strictly less than one. In this case, if we add the floor of beta plus the floor of beta plus one half, we get the floor of beta. We can write this beta as the floor of beta plus the fractional part of beta. The floor of beta can be taken outside because it's an integer. Now we have the floor of one half plus the fractional part of beta. This is a number between one and one half. So the floor is equal to one. This sum here is one plus two times the floor of beta. The floor of two beta is the floor of two times the floor of beta plus two times the fractional part of beta. This is an integer, can be taken outside. And then we have the floor of two times the fractional part of beta. That's a number between one and two and is strictly less than two. This floor is equal to one. We also get the same result here and there. This means that for every real valued beta, the floor of two beta is equal to the floor of beta plus the floor of beta plus one half. Let's go back to our first result and replace alpha on both sides by alpha plus pi. We get pi over 2 minus alpha over 2 minus pi over 2 plus pi, the floor of alpha plus pi over pi. This is pi, the floor of alpha over pi plus 1. This is pi times the floor of alpha over pi plus pi times 1. Finally, we have minus pi times the floor of alpha plus pi over 2 pi plus 1 half. This is the floor of alpha over 2 pi plus 1. We get minus pi, the floor of alpha over 2 pi minus pi. These two terms go away. We have pi times the floor of alpha over pi, which can be written as 2 times alpha over 2 pi, minus pi, the floor of alpha over 2 pi. But from this result here, we know that the floor of 2 beta minus the floor of beta is equal to the floor of beta plus 1 half. This means that this difference here is equal to the floor of alpha over 2 pi plus 1 half. We can move this to the left-hand side and divide by pi to get that this floor of 1 half plus alpha over 2 pi is equal to alpha over 2 pi plus summation over positive integer n of sine alpha plus pi n divided by pi n. This is sine alpha n cosine pi n plus cosine alpha n sine pi n. For every integer n, sine pi n is equal to 0. And for every integer n, cosine pi n is minus 1 to the power n. We can write the floor of alpha over 2 pi plus 1 half equal to alpha over 2 pi plus the sum n from 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the n over pi n times sine alpha n. We will need these two integrals. Eta and gamma are positive real numbers. The first is integral x from 0 to infinity of x sine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared. The second integral is x from 0 to infinity cosine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared. Let's focus on this integral first. We do complex contour integration. The contour is this semicircle on the real axis. It is from minus r to r where r is greater than this positive real number gamma. If we consider the function f of z equal to z e to the i eta z over z squared plus gamma squared, then there is a pole at gamma i and another one at minus gamma i. The pole of interest is the one inside the contour. By the residue theorem, the value of the integral is 2 pi i times the limit as z tends to i gamma of z minus gamma i times f of z. When we multiply, this goes away. Now we replace z by i gamma. From here, we get 1 half. 1 half times 2 pi i is pi i. We also have e to the minus eta gamma. This contour integral is an integral over the real axis from minus r to r of x e to the i eta x over x squared plus gamma squared. Then we have an integral over this part where z is equal to big R times e to the i phi and phi is from 0 to pi. The integrand is obtained from here by replacing every z by r e to the i phi. dz is equal to r i e to the i phi d phi. We show now that this integral tends to 0 as big R tends to infinity. The magnitude of this integral, which is omega, is upper bounded by the integral of the magnitude. That's the triangle inequality for integrals. We have r squared, the magnitude of i is 1, the magnitude of e to the i phi is 1. This exponential is e to the i eta r times cosine phi plus i sine phi. When we take the magnitude, we obtain e to the minus eta r sine phi.
the reverse triangle inequality states that for the complex numbers Z1 and Z2, the magnitude of Z1 plus Z2 is greater than or equal to the magnitude of Z1 minus the magnitude of Z2. This means that 1 over the magnitude of Z1 plus Z2 is less than or equal to 1 over the magnitude of Z1 minus the magnitude of Z2. We can upper bound 1 over the magnitude of R squared e to the i 2 phi plus gamma squared by 1 over the magnitude of this part, which is R squared minus the magnitude of this part, which is gamma squared. And we assume that R is strictly greater than gamma. This part does not depend on phi. We can take it outside the integral. Also, sine phi is a function that is symmetric about phi equal pi over 2. We can write down this integral as double the integral phi from 0 to pi over 2 of e to the minus eta r sine phi. We then multiply by r squared divided by r squared minus gamma squared. We try to upper bound the integrand, exploiting the fact that the sine function is concave over the interval from 0 to pi over 2. If we differentiate the sine function twice, we get minus sine phi between 0 and pi over 2. When phi is positive and is less than pi over 2, minus sine phi is negative. We have indeed a concave function. So if we pick lambda between 0 and 1 and two angles in this range, phi 1 and phi 2, sine lambda phi 1 plus 1 minus lambda phi 2, because of the concavity of the sine function, is greater than or equal to lambda sine phi 1 plus 1 minus lambda sine phi 2. If we set phi 1 equal to pi over 2 and phi 2 equal to 0, we get that sine lambda times pi over 2 is greater than or equal to lambda. Now, if lambda is equal to phi over pi over 2, and because phi is in this range, then lambda is between 0 and 1, we get that sine phi is greater than or equal to 2 phi over pi. If we multiply both sides by minus eta r, we get this inequality. If we exponentiate, we get that e to the minus eta r sine phi is less than or equal to e to the minus 2 over pi eta r phi. We integrate both sides from 0 to pi over 2. This integral here is upper bounded by this integral, which we can evaluate as pi over 2 eta r times 1 minus e to the minus eta r. The upper bound on the magnitude of integral omega is this quantity multiplied by 2 r squared over r squared minus gamma squared. We get this upper bound as r tends to infinity this bracket tends to 1, and this fraction tends to 0. This integral here tends to 0 as r tends to infinity, which means that i pi e to the minus eta gamma is equal to the limit of this integral as r tends to infinity. We have this result here. Taking the imaginary part of both sides, we get the integral over real valued x of x sine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared is equal to pi e to the minus eta gamma. If we integrate from 0 to infinity, we get pi over 2 e to the minus eta gamma. To obtain the second integral, we do the exact same steps. In fact, it is an easier integral. Once we reach here, we don't have r squared like the integral above. We just have r. We have the ratio r over r squared minus gamma squared. We can upper bound this exponential by 1 because this power is non-negative as phi is between 0 and pi. The integral is upper bounded by pi r over r squared minus gamma squared. The ratio r over r squared minus gamma squared tends to zero as r tends to infinity. In our case here, this is the complex function. If we apply the residue theorem, we get pi over gamma e to the minus eta gamma, and it is equal to this integral along the real axis plus this integral in the limit as r tends to infinity. This goes to zero, and we get that the integral over real valued x of e to the i eta x over x squared plus gamma squared equal to pi over gamma e to the minus eta gamma. If we take the real part of both sides, we get that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of cosine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared equal to pi over gamma e to the minus eta gamma. We get half this quantity if the integral is over positive x. Now we can solve our problem using these three results. As I said at the beginning, since x is between 2n minus 1 times pi and 2n plus 1 times pi, then x over 2 pi plus 1 half is between n and n plus 1. This means we can bring this n inside and replace it by the floor of x over 2 pi plus 1 half. When we do this, the sum is integral x from pi to infinity of the floor times sine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared. Gamma is a positive real number, and eta is in the open interval between 0 and 1. Note that we can extend this integral and start from 0. The reason for this is that if x is between 0 and pi, x over 2 pi is between 0 and 1 half. x over 2 pi plus 1 half is between 1 half and 1. 
and the floor is equal to zero. We can safely integrate over positive x. Now we use the result that this floor is x over 2 pi plus summation over positive n of minus 1 to the n over pi n sine nx. Now this part here is 1 over 2 pi integral x from 0 to infinity of x sine eta x over x squared plus gamma squared. This is 1 over 2 pi times pi over 2 e to the minus eta gamma. This is 1 fourth of e to the minus eta gamma. For the other part, we assume that we can do term by term integration. We have sine nx times sine eta x. This is equal to one half cosine the difference n minus eta x minus one half cosine the sum n plus eta x. Note that because eta is between zero and one and n is a positive integer, then n minus eta is strictly positive. We can apply our result for the integral involving the cosine function, replacing eta by n minus eta here and by n plus eta there. So we get by over two gamma e to the minus gamma times n minus eta minus e to the minus gamma n plus eta. This bracket is e to the minus n gamma times e to the eta gamma minus e to the minus eta gamma. This can be taken outside the sum. We can also take a minus one outside the sum and one over four gamma. We are left with summation over positive integer n of minus one to the n minus one over n e to the minus gamma all to the power n. And this is exactly the Taylor series expansion of the natural logarithm of one plus e to the minus gamma. We can also write this bracket here as two times the hyperbolic sine of eta gamma. Our final result is one fourth e to the minus eta gamma minus the hyperbolic sine of eta gamma divided by two gamma times the natural logarithm of one plus e to the minus gamma.